This week, fear and loathing is piled upon fear and loathing. Because, well, as it seems to me, the rich and the powerful get out the old playbook and work from it yet again. But before I get into it, um, before I you know, look at where we stand today, um, I think it's probably a good idea to have a bit of a glimpse of history. Because it's always a little glimpse of history that triggers the rest of how I think. I found a collection of pieces about places and characters from the Jacobite rebellions. And that's always something that, you know, that catches my eye. That's a, a subject of great interest to me. Uh, and so I was I was reading around that. And in one of them, I, I read about a house uh, on Sky. It was a ruin for a while, but it's been it's been renovated. And it's now, I think it's like a guest, how, you know, um, a holiday accommodation. Uh, but there's a it has a history and there's a blue plaque on the wall that attests to the fact that it, it provided shelter and, and, and food and drink to Bonnie Prince Charlie uh, for a period of time in the aftermath of the 1745 rebellion. So after Culloden, when he was on the run uh, and hiding from the, the, the British government in the Highlands and in the islands, this was one of the, the premises that, that provided succour uh, while he was in need. Uh, and it was home... I don't think it was the principal home, but it was it was home to a chief, the chief of the Macdonald clan, on Skye. Uh, and as a, as part of the background, the author of the piece uh, he detailed how that particular uh, Macdonald clan chief had had kept himself out of the rebellion. He hadn't taken part. He hadn't come out as the as they used to say in those days, for the Bonnie Prince. And he even spoke up in support of the Hanoverian government to save his skin. Uh, the senior legal figure in Scotland had got intelligence, had known actually for a long time that that particular Macdonald had, 10 years before the 1745 rebellion, had plotted, had colluded with the neighbouring chief of the Macleods of Skye and together they had planned to round up their own clan's men, women and children and to sell them into indentured slavery in the American colonies. Now they were thwarted, they, they got rumbled and the, and the plot didn't come off. However, this is what these two clan chiefs had been preparing to do. This, the senior legal figure, had kept this information in his back pocket Right, knowing that it one sooner or later, one day or another, it would be useful to him. And duly, when the when word spread that a, a Jacobite rebellion was was uh, was on the way, uh, this senior legal figure let this clan chief know that if he was to come out for the prince, he would ruin him. He would he would come, he would bring charges actually for what had been for what had been plotted against his own people. Uh, so. And it did. It worked. The, the the clan chief, to save his own skin, kept himself out of the of the forty five rebellion. Now, can you imagine these two chiefs, who by tradition were the fathers of their people? I mean, a clan is a family, and the clan chief is the father of the clan. And these two characters were plotting to sell their own people as slaves, you know, just for pure profit. And. I got thinking, you know, the legend of the Jacobite Rebellion, it's often portrayed as as the stance taken by honourable men risking everything for the cause, for the glorious cause of putting a Stuart monarch back on the throne. And sometimes it was. Sometimes sometimes people did act honourably. But, you know, you look at that Macdonald chief and, you, and you're reminded that again and again, down through history, you know, the rich and the powerful have cared not a fig, not a jot for the people that are notionally or supposedly in their care. Quite the opposite, in fact. And it's harrowing over and over again to be reminded of. And I thought about that this week when I was watching, like everyone else, the latest horror, the latest atrocity play out in Israel. And, you know, we've, we've been invited to watch unspeakable things um, and I'll leave that there I think everyone everyone who's, who's, who's well 
unless you unless you're asleep under a under a rock somewhere you know you know that of which I speak but but you know I think by now I'm so after three years just passed you can see that the playbook is in hand again and it it's fairly obvious that apart from anything else we're being prepped for a war another war that could spiral into something well who knows what something huge a conflagration in that benighted part of the world that will consume hundreds of thousands who knows I, i've listened to some military uh, analysts suggesting that it, you know it could run into the millions depending on exactly what begins to un, unfold off the back of and in consequence and in reaction to what we've already seen and so many of us i would say we we look on we just look out at the world now, whatever, and with eyes wide open. And and we see that one way or another, once and again, people are set at one another's throats. You know, hatred is everywhere. And there are the inevitable calls for terrible vengeance. And it's it's happened before and it's happening again. And I look on and I know only one thing for certain, only one thing for certain, and that is that the price will be paid by more ordinary people. People with no power, people with no involvement, just people. And the meat grinder will be fed and yet more butchered meat will be the only product. That's the only thing I know for certain is going to happen and I think and, I, and I'm not alone in thinking though that more and more people are looking at whatever is the latest thing the latest horror the latest emergency the latest call for war and feeling at the very least a nagging sense of doubt it's it's undeniable more and more people, I would say, are looking on at the world, at terror after terror, at fear and loathing, piled on fear and loathing, and sensing a recurrent pattern. I think you can't not see it. And once you do see it, you can never unsee it. And it seems to me, and I know that it seems to others, that three years ago, three years ago now, the powers that be across the West, across the world, saw an opportunity to reset that world in their favour. It was an opportunity to seize total power once and for all. And they went for it. Presumably the time seemed right. And they went for it with fear as their principal tool. With hatred as its handmaiden. Stoking it against one, one group after another. Always othering some minority. So that they could become the focus of majority fury and elected representatives scientists not all scientists but a lot of scientists physicians not all physicians but a lot of physicians academics the mainstream media all came together in an unholy union an unholy alliance to frighten the living daylights out of out of the populations and they they knowingly set in place you know policies and they pushed products that they must have known carried dire risks. They pushed lockdowns and coercive manipulation of behaviour in the knowledge that harm would inevitably be done. And harm has been done and continues to be done. And, you know, with, with hardly any exceptions, every single one of them that, that pushed that agenda is still there. I mean, to me, every single person that pushed that agenda, that caused harm that was inevitable, they should have gone by now. They should have lost their positions. But on the contrary, the vast majority of them are still there. And, you know, here's the thing. Here's the thing, though. By their actions, and by their actions since, they have utterly destroyed 
those individuals any relationship with the people built on trust. Trust's a fragile thing, really. You know, it, once it's gone, it's gone. And for many, many people, and more and more people every day, that trust that they assumed between themselves and the powers that be, it's gone, and it's never coming back. And in the absence of that trust, more and more people have watched each successive move on the part of the powerful with mounting disbelief. After COVID r began to run out of steam um, and, and lockdowns were, were running out of steam, there was the war in Ukraine. Just there it was. Just when it was needed, it was there. And it has revealed international corruption and money laundering on a global scale. There's plenty of evidence already that some of the weapons that were used um, against Israelis in Israel, some of those weapons had come straight from Ukraine. They had been, they had been uh, delivered to Ukraine and then they had been transferred out on the black market or by whatever means and they ended up being the tools by which those those atrocities were were committed. Uh, then there's you know there's net zero and climate crisis, so-called crisis uh, that has revealed scientific dishonesty. Let's say from top to bottom, we see and we understand only too well that we're being primed for central bank digital currencies and digital IDs uh, because because we're to be shorn of every last vestige of our freedom. And many of us see it. More and more people see it. And in the end, it all comes back to that loss of trust. We were had. And some of us have admitted it. We were had. And we look out at those who are still working from the playbook and we see that they're hanging on grimly. They're making more and more of the same old moves. Moves that look increasingly uh, desperate and also increasingly obvious. You know, I say again, ask yourself who will pay the price of the next thing? Who will pay the ultimate price? It will be the same that always pays the price. The people. The people. Black, white and brown. Christian, Muslim, Jewish. Whatever. The people will pay the price. Over and over again, we are set at one another's throats. Everywhere you look, some group is being baited to hate another group. It's got a terrifying regularity to it and so you know we must ask ourselves always who benefits from the chaos who benefits from the fear that the people are experiencing who ultimately benefits from the from the sowing of hatred and the application of hatred and who's immune to more to the point who is immune from the consequences of the latest appalling atrocity So who pays? Who gets hurt? Who gets destroyed? Always it's the people. It's people. Perhaps though, perhaps the day is not too far off when finally enough of us have seen through the illusion. The tired, old, wicked tricks. And perhaps the time is close or not too far off when there will be a paradigm shift. A, a final awakening to the realisation about who the bad guys really are.